wanted to do was to try and kind of gather up um, and comment on some of the, the kind of themes of the weekend uh, and possibly kind of en route um, to problematize uh, kind of part of the discourse um, which links the idea of memory to an idea of memorial to an idea of the centrality of remembering the Holocaust. I feel kind of somewhat naked um, in doing so because uh, the material I find very difficult to kind of think about and uh, to comment on. Can I kind of take up one point first of all? It's been mentioned by various speakers that soon there will be no one living who experienced the Holocaust. In a way I want to point out there never has been anyone living who experienced the Holocaust. Um, I want first of all to deal with like what you might call a first set of problems about the relationship between the Holocaust uh, and memory. First of all from the point of view of the criminal conspiracy uh, launched by the Nazis uh, and secondly about the problem of gathering, sustaining and representing evidence uh, about that experience. <clears throat> it's frequently forgotten that from the Nazis' point of view, the uh, conspiracy to murder the Jews was already understood to be a criminal conspiracy. It wasn't, as it were, um, a part of the public policy of the Nazi party. It was perfectly well understood from Himmler from Himmler downwards that as it were not only was this to be a murder conducted as far as possible in secret it would always have to remain a secret there would be no point even if the Third Reich had become victorious in which the secret of the Holocaust would or could ever be disclosed first of all to the German people and you can begin to see that I want to shed a kind of slightly different light on the relationship between that criminal conspiracy and what very easily is talked about especially outside Germany the German people you could go so far as to say as it were that the secrecy of the Holocaust was part of the Holocaust. In that sense, subsequently to gather, amass and represent evidence of that conspiracy becomes a fundamental intellectual and political kind of injunction. Indeed, for many Jews, it has an aspect of theodicy about it when Fackenheim, for example, uh, marks the significance of the Holocaust by saying that where Jews normally have 212 commandments, a new one is added. The 213th commandment which in Fackenheim's formulation is that there be no posthumous victories to Hitler. It's not my intention to be kind of contentious, but I think one needs to kind of, you know, bring back some of the issues uh, of kind of criminality. It's a 
gathering, amassing and representing evidence, first of all, in the immediate period after 45, in order to pursue justice. At one point, Hannah Arendt remarks, she wished she heard less about collective guilt, less about mourning, and more about some trials starting. The, as it were, the, the failure, and it's not necessarily solely the fa failure of the German state, it's clearly a kind of, to some extent, tangled consequence of the history of the emergence of NATO and of the Cold War, but clearly the kind of failure to pursue the consequences of the Holocaust as a kind of criminal search, I mean as a search for criminal justice, is one which itself should not be overshadowed by the more generalized talk about maintaining something kind of in as memory. Now probably the time for kind of that kind of trial is finished. Somehow the prospect of dragging one or two elderly wretches back from Paraguay kind of can't, I think, kind of quite meet anyone's idea of what the enactment of justice be. But as it were, one of the problems here is not so much that soon what were called the victims of the Holocaust will no longer be alive because they never have been. The problem now is that we have gone beyond the stage in which justice can be expected and enacted. Nor, I think, should anyone think that the subsidiary forms of justice For example, of you know, punishing Swiss banks uh, for the fact that they laundered money. What else are Swiss banks for? Um, and the thought that this campaign was run by Senator D'Amato <coughs> on the hunt for Jewish votes in New York State is hardly edifying. My point is that in some sense we are what we are moving towards the end of is a certain kind of epoch. Uh, in which any of the issue can be handled um, through the medium of criminal justice. And in a sense, we have to look back on that period by acknowledging across the board, and this is not just an issue for the German state, acknowledging across the board that that criminal conspiracy was dealt with in an offensively lenient and cowardly form. Again, I recognize that in a sense, um, you know, this is to, to bring an edge of contention to the issue, but nothing less than the degree of plain speaking kind of is acceptable. Now, if on the one hand, one problem is the failure to pursue the criminal conspiracy to murder the Jews, and in a sense that makes it more difficult to, to collect and maintain the archive, the archive which becomes the basis of what I'm going to call public knowledge concerning uh, the Holocaust. Nonetheless, I suppose we can say, and Giorgio Agamben does, uh, in one of the early chapters of his stunning book, The Remnants of Auschwitz, he says, in some sense, we do have a kind of historical scheme. We do have an adequate functioning, working historian's knowledge of the scope, the structure, the sequence, the kind of order of the Holocaust. What we don't have, of course, is any understanding. 
Now, when it comes to the question of understanding, we kind of have here a sort of second problem of the question of the unrepresentable. The term, as you may have noticed, unrepresentable, um, is almost one of the words used in every American academic article about the Holocaust and seems to refer to a wide range of sources or conditions which are supposed to render the event unrepresentable. It's frequently linked, I think quite wrongly, to the idea of trauma. That is to say that because survivors had experienced an existence of such extremity, their mouths would open to speak of the Holocaust and, in effect, fall silent. They could speak of it, but somehow not speak it. In a way which I find kind of slightly unpleasant, a lot of people now argue that, in some sense, even readers of texts <coughs> on the Holocaust suffer, as it were, what you might call a sort of minor readerly uh, trauma. And that somehow this again contributes to an event which, at the level of comprehension, still maintains a kind of secrecy. A secrecy not so much in terms of conspiracy, but a secrecy at and in the order of representation. Now, I must say, I don't really understand that. Uh, or rather, again, I prefer kind of Giorgio Agamben's argument, which itself is a gloss on the writings of Primo Levi. <coughs> Primo Levi, who in many ways offended a number of American Holocaust kind of authorities really quite deeply uh, by speaking in kind of accents so clear uh, about what you could or could not say about the Holocaust. Primo Levi was primarily preoccupied with the fact that one way of becoming a survivor in the Holocaust, one way of actually becoming a survivor was precisely to adopt the wish to say it afterwards. That, that already uh, the desire to bear testimony was itself an experience of some of those like himself in the camps, but as it were, precisely because they were able to survive on the basis of having elected the role of being a kind of messenger of the experience of the Holocaust, were forever cut off from that experience. As you probably know, for Levy, the true experience of the Holocaust from which one never returns is not simply the biological fact of death, but that descent of the Jew in probably one of the most astonishing linguistic terms of the 20th century, that descent of the Jew into the term which is known in the camps as the Muslim man. The human being who is biologically I dead, sorry, alive, but who gives no indication of having a human identity, who has walked into a state prior to their biological death from which no one has ever returned. These are, as it were, some of the things of which there can be no memory. And the fantasy that there can be a memory of them, I'll argue later, sets up a number of cultural and political difficulties. Let me kind of draw a sort of first, very 
kind of tentative distinction. It is a radical, you might say, commandment that we know, or that it is known, what is the history of the Holocaust. At the level of what you might call a public scholarly discourse. And that that be guaranteed in a way that once won, it can never be lost. That, I'm insisting, we call knowledge. It's a kind of public knowledge. It sets limits on the pluralism of discussions about the Holocaust so that what we say to a Holocaust denier is not, let me show you that it did, it's that we do not speak to them nor give them a platform. I mean, in America, there have been appalling situations where the media have, like, invited Holocaust deniers on to discuss with Holocaust historians, you know, as the fair way of establishing did it really happen or not. That is not the way to conduct the debate. Then there are those people who think that the important point about memory, and it was repeated in kind of insolent tones uh, by Tony Blair um, at the first celebration of whatever it was called, Holocaust Saturday or something. Um, apparently, they, New Labour had chosen the date uh, for the Holocaust ceremonial and just forgot it was the Sabbath. But there you go. Um, he said, let not six million Jews perish without our learning the lessons of Auschwitz. Now, one's heard this kind of unspeakable cliche time and time again. You think, well, what are the lessons of Auschwitz? Like, don't kill Jews, don't vote for Hitler. I mean, people have to die to kind of, you know, put up these kind of lessons. My point is that it is a complete derogation, a complete kind of insult to the very discussion of the question of the public discourse. Uh, of course, here is a footnote. We inescapably get into the question of, on Holocaust Day, who are we talking about? Are we talking about six million murdered Jews? Or are we talking about all victims of what might be called a Holocaust? When the Holocaust Museum was going up in uh, New York, obviously this was like, you know, the most difficult problem they had to look at. Like, what do you do about the others? The kind of compromise position I think sometimes known as the, the Carter Wiesenthal position, um, is that over history there have been, and this is where you get the figure, 11 million victims of the Holocaust, uh, 6 million Jews, 5 million others. Um, actually, when confronted with this figure as to where on earth Simon Wiesenthal had got the figure of 5 million from, he pretty much admitted he made it up. I mean. You don't have to be Sigmund Freud to work out. The point about the, the Gentiles is they got one million less. You know, therefore, they're not, you know, there's at least a statistical basis for not putting it on a kind of equal footing. Um, these questions aren't going to go away. There is some demented American professor uh, whose book, I think, now runs to three volumes, uh, a history of all kind of atrocities everywhere, in which he argues that, like, the Jewish Holocaust has, like, 17 fundamental features. And then everyone else, you know, like, victims of the Spanish Inquisition, <coughs> whatever, you know, they, none of them, I think, scores more than about 13. So on this kind of academic scorecard, the exclusivity of the Holocaust for the Jews is preserved. We'll come back to that 
in a moment. In a way, what I'm going to say something about is some of the problems that arise about the Holocaust in the States, um, partly because I think they're particularly vivid, um, but also because I want to end by thinking what within Europe would be an entirely different kind of take on the question. But before I can make my central argument, which is concerns the relationship between mourning and memory, uh, I have to refer back to Sigmund Freud's own argument about the nature of mourning and about the nature of memory. One of the things I should be doing, in a sense, is suggesting that Holocaust discourse makes a fatal confusion of the instances or the registers of mourning and memory. And that one has to go back and sort out what these are. Let me just give a sort of child's guide to Freud's argument. For example, someone you love dies. You enter what is known as a period of grief. What does that grief actually consist on in, at a kind of structural level? For Freud, the first aspect of grief, in a way, is the refusal to allow the dead loved object to die. The first, the first move that the subject makes in an outpouring of grief is to identify with the loved object so that it cannot have and it will not die. If you watch people in the process of mourning, you'll see this. It can be at the quietest and most minute domestic level. Until she died, she who loved gardening, he hated gardening. From the day of her death, he will be found at all hours in the garden. There is a kind of massive identification the space of the subject has, as it were, to make room for someone else. You cannot, as it were, according to an internal law, allow them to die. This fierce identification is not itself the work of grief. The work of grief comes in a little while. This violent act of identification in which I refuse to allow the loved object to die is one where I kind of, in effect, internally deny the biological reality. But the space of subjectivity is not such a space that can easily tolerate two. As it were, the subject is a space made for one. The problem with identifying is that this identification turns against me. Not only through my identification am I out there gardening, I find cause for ceaseless recrimination of myself. The act of identification in mourning begins to induce guilt in me. Guilt that I have not or that I did not 
do what I should have done. In a kind of dark and patristic formula, Freud says, the shadow of the object falls upon the echo. In a sense, we begin to see here, as it were, that this is a situation which ultimately the economy of the subject cannot sustain and tolerate. And here begins the work of grief. The work of grief is not about the identification. It is about undoing it. It is, in effect, about following each seam of identification and unpicking it, thread by thread. In effect, the work of grief is that which allows the subject, or rather the object, to die now for a second time, to die really, to die for reasons which finally one knows internally. Religions which in this way seem to be much, much wiser uh, than secular rationality have obviously a whole organized space for finally encouraging you to complete the work of grief because only then can the subject who is now allowed to die to die really only now can the object enter into the domain of memory right? in a sense only after the stone setting. Now, what is it for that object now to exist not in the register of violent identification, but in the register of memory? I think we might make several observations about this. First of all, the primacy, and obviously, most obviously in Judaism, the primacy of the importance for memory of the name. Essentially, what I remember, in so far as I remember you, not at the hour of your death, but the you whose continuity is your whole life, the duration of that whole life can most, I was going to say graphically, be given through letters. It is your name. It is what, it is what the name will do in the representation of the person that no painting can ever do and the anti-representational bias of Judaism has, of course, always known that you are best expressed as the inscription of your name. There is another aspect of the name. Names come one by one by one. In the, rec in the register of memory, there is no such thing as a collectivity. There is an utterly individual arithmetic. The term six million here refers not to a collectivity, it refers to the next number when you've already said five million 999,999. It's the next one. And if it's not the next one, it's nothing. Six million, as such, is a category for demographers. 
It is not, it cannot belong to the registry, to, sorry, to the register uh, of memory. There are one or two other points one could make about the structure of Freud's argument. Second half of his paper is not actually on memory, it's on melancholia, what we would call depression. If the dead one gets stuck there in the structure of the subject, there where I'm complaining about myself, where I'm feeling guilty, the more and the longer I feel guilty, the greater will be the reaction to it. Freud notices that whenever anyone is very depressed and they're speaking of what now social workers call low self-esteem, as if anyone should ever have anything else, um, <laughs> Freud notices that the, that the self-hatred which the depressive gives voice to always has an aggressive edge. You know, they're supposed to be saying how awful they are, but somehow it's already an attack upon the world. It is, as it were, the revenge that the subject takes for having been made guilty. Anyone who thinks any progressive politics ever could work through the inauguration and installation and perpetuation of guilt is a fool. It will burst out as a negative return of the repressed. People should have objectives because they choose them. Indeed, here, at the register of the unconscious, one can say there cannot be things like collective guilt. I think collective guilt is an absurd uh, concept, even at a national and historical level. It precisely erases, in a peculiar way, the, the very instance of saying a crime of murder. Right? A collectivity cannot commit a crime of murder, though it is a crime which can be shared. There can be co-conspirators, there can be accomplices, there are all sorts of legal categories for indirection without having to specify some instance of a collectivity. I think nothing could be more shocking in a way than seeing the book which although it ostensibly denies the allegation of collective guilt, um, the, sorry I've forgotten his name, the Hitler's Willing Executioners book, sorry, Goldhagen and its reception finally where I think sort of Habermas stands up and gives him a prize. Um, for what is a historical slander against the German people, that is to say that in 1933 Germany already possessed a collective, almost uniform, murderous wish to kill all Jews. I mean, it just seems to me as a historical proposition manifoldly absurd. I want to turn for a moment to just look at some aspects of the Washington Holocaust Memorial in light, in a way, of the points that I've raised through Freud. Now, of course, as I've already indicated, one of the problems that the Holocaust Museum had was who is being remembered. I haven't seen it myself, but everything I read or I'm told uh, by friends 
is that in essence there's supposed to be a deal where everyone's represented but it's overwhelmingly almost exclusively Jewish uh, in its references. Now, apparently when you enter, in order to perhaps give a school child kind of more of an interest in the whole business of going to this museum, the entrant is twinned with a Holocaust victim. You're given, apparently, the name and the identity uh, of a victim, um, and you're enabled, through various technical means, to kind of trace the, pro the progress through the history and the machine of this victim. Now, what can one kind of say about such a perverse idea? One thing that I think you can say is that there is no question of memory in this. What, in effect, you are being invited to do is to identify, but only very temporarily, to identify with that aspect which we're calling mourning. Right? It's the, the museum is neither about what I've called the public discourse, what knowledge we have, nor is it, in any sense, about memory. It is the direct and manipulative attempt to engineer a situation where, for a short time, someone identifies in a way which is analogous to mourning I say only for a short while, apparently outside the Holocaust Memorial has to be swept up several times a day as the kind of tickets of identity of victims which have just been tossed away uh, by the visitor as they leave the museum. You may think that in a way uh, this is a kind of exaggeration. But let me put it to you this way. I mean, this, what I would call a kind of disnification of grief, um, is becoming a kind of cultural object in itself. It goes some way, for example, to explain why so many museums, and I would say so much art, which is supposed to be in one way or another related to the Holocaust takes a highly kind of pictorial uh, is very strongly kind of image um, based and is almost obsessively concerned with the presence or perhaps absence of the body. One is led to I think the inescapable conclusion that over the process of Holocaust memory itself, there is, in a very curious way, a kind of massive Christianization of the iconography. That is to say, it is, after all, Christians who are concerned with the representation of the body as an image of suffering. It is Christians who collect relics and have done for ages and so the the narrativization of these stages the, the shoes, the clothes the human hair all actually fit all too neatly into a kind of Christian iconography of suffering. Okay. I don't think anyone's kind of really either kind of noticed this. It is itself, after all, so completely alien to anything Jewish. Right? I mean, it's... I mean, either you can discuss it at a theological level, 
or as people's grandmothers might say, it's just not nice. Uh, um, I mean, like, who needs it? Uh, and yet, it has become, as it were, what you might call the fabrication of an entire kind of Holocaust imaginary. But one which turns out to be a kind of Christian. It is a sort of a via dolorosa. One sees the confusion not only here amongst well-disposed Christians, one sees it in a number of Jews, Elie Wiesel being one of them, who I seem to remember, you know, describes seeing uh, the fiery sky above Auschwitz as an image of the crucifixion. It's a, it's a kind of powerful, pandemic, but extremely perverse thing. The second problem about this, what you might call Holocaust imaginary, which is part of the economy of mourning, albeit you might call it the commodification of, of mourning, is the perversity. I don't stand here to say perversity uh, out of some sense of kind of respectability, but I do remember, for example, being at a kind of Holocaust conference not far from here two years ago when I was presenting the work of the Vienna Holocaust Memorial and listening afterwards to a discussion about ethics um, by two curators of Holocaust museums. Uh, they were having a heated exchange. They violently disagreed with each other. And the problem they were discussing was whether as the curator of a Holocaust museum, it was or was not ethical to use preservative on human hair. I think that discussion is better kept for the laboratories of Dr. Mengele. It is, it is to be having a discussion that you shouldn't be having. There is no way by any kind of argument or intuition of ethics that it can be appropriate to enter into the perversity of the situation. And here I'd kind of keep the last kind of point, which in a sense I think I probably don't need to elaborate on. Once you have organized an imaginary of horror in this way, we know that behind the conscious horror which people experience when they're horrified, behind that conscious horror, they are already experiencing an unconscious pleasure. One can already, in American culture, begin to tease out how, for example, that kind of, what you might call kind of Holocaust imaginary, has already begun to to kind of saturate certain cinematic popular culture. And I would argue in that sense that the, the sets, the sort of oddly sort of, sort of a more biological Boltansky is there um, in something like the X-Files. Right? That is to say that if you wish to kind of make sense of how some of that imagery got set up, it is borrowed. So there is the problem of the, the kind of Disneyfication of grief has an extremely kind of negative kind of set of effects. The problem, of course, is that its experience is being a very successful kind of instrument. Someone told me yesterday uh, that in Germany, I think last week, uh, both, the, I think, the Finkelstein book on the Holocaust industry, uh, but more importantly, I think, the Novik book on the Holocaust in American life, which is itself, I think, a very serious study. 
He quotes the Harvard historian Charles Meyer in saying the problem that is currently, in a sense, being set up by this economy, in the States at least, is that grief leads to grievance. And as it were, grievance leads to a certain kind of claim. It is as if a number of political objectives are no longer being put forward in what you might call a kind of classical formulation of this is an objective and you build su support around that kind of objective. It is rather the emergence of kind of identity politics all of whom are currently demanding their own holocaust. Uh, Novik describes a process um, of what he describes as holocaust envy uh, across a number of political groups kind of in the states. Now obviously we in Europe can hasten to a kind of add that on the one hand perhaps not all our politics has been converted into identity politics and at the same time some of the dangers of that kind of Holocaust imaginary kind of might be avoided. But it stems, I think, from this fundamental confusion between what the register of memory is and what mourning is. As if almost, as if it were a good thing to encourage someone to mourn, right? I mean, so many misunderstandings have been based around that, none least of historians who in the 60s used to refer to Germans' inability to mourn as if that characterized their relation to the Holocaust. Right? What was very interesting, because it soon became one of those sort of popular misconceptions, what's interesting is that it was based on a psychoanalytic argument which said the obstruction towards dealing with the Holocaust came about through Germans' inability to mourn their own parents who died. Not the Jews, their own parents. And until that obstruction, I mean, until the repression of the suffering and death of their parents had been dealt with, then one could hardly kind of unfreeze the situation in respect to the Holocaust. <coughs> I've tried to draw, albeit kind of very sketchily, a differentiation between the question of testimony and evidence, which is and has to remain a kind of absolutely crucial aspect of public discourse. Right. That is where not just the memory, that is where the evidence will always be. It's not resting upon people's memory. It rests upon evidence and its force will last, though only last as long as the rule of evidence remains. That is different from memory. I think memory cannot be asked to perform those kind of public duties. I think the last point I want to make is that when I look at the projects which have been produced um, today and have been shown, I'm struck really by how inappropriate at any level it would be to think about them in terms of memorials. I mean, no matter how they might sort of currently be classified, what I want to think about at the end is something that I think is entirely different, isn't to do with memory as such, but is in a way something that all those projects kind of were doing. The problem here is how we deal not with 
persons and what have happened to persons, but how we deal with the sites in which those events have happened. It is as if in the late 20th century, and against all our rational expectations, that we see the return of a taboo place, of a place which is, because of its kind of history and its nature, in some sense, contaminated. It may be kind of haunted. Spaces of a certain kind of, kind of horror. And the question really then is what could be done about them? I think, for example, that when Matthias was talking about the, the first kind of proposal just to do in a sort of gesture of timid social democratic virtue, cover it all up with good social housing, I mean, the point is, obviously, that when one comes upon a taboo object, when one comes upon a haunted, when one comes upon, one should make no bones about it, an evil place whose evil is not extinguished with the cessation of its use. It's an evil location which goes on and reproduces it until someone does something not so much to it but for it. I mean, this is why, in a sense, intuitively, the proposal to bury it beneath a welter of well-intentioned social housing simply constitutes a repression. One does not have to be a sort of occultist to know in one's bones that something bad would happen. I mean, I, you know, I offer this you know, as, a, as a, a genuine conviction. It's, it's, it's very difficult to kind of find a language which doesn't almost seem superstitious, but not all our superstitions are wrong. What's at stake, you could say, in some of what has been presented, is the kind of the relief of a landscape, is the approach to a site, not in order initially to kind of subject it to some other purpose, no matter how well intentioned, it is in some sense to be able to lift a curse. Now again, to describe in that way may seem to you uh, to sort of have a, an aspect of infantile uh, superstition about it. But I think, in fact, one knows perfectly well across the whole range of landscape there are evil places, there are places in need of relief, to which one's relation, perhaps late in the day, we begin to find that this may be a function and possibly a talent which architects possess, which is to bring some solicitude to this site. Doubtless the site will continue just as the survivor continues to bear the scar tissue of the evil that has befallen the site. But I think at this stage it makes sense to confront directly <coughs> and as boldly as possible, the kind of evil earth of that site. Now, if we knit that argument kind of back to the question of memorials, we can begin to see that there is a work of solicitude which may be kind of overtaking some of the illusions of the traditional memorial and perhaps hopefully we'll be able to avoid falling into the kind of grand guignol 
kind of Holocaust imaginary. It is by nature a task which is complex, in which, I think again, as Matthias very well described, the, the architect is kind of humble in his offices. Not everything at once. Solicitude means that the relation to the site would inevitably one be one over time. It is strange, in a way, that the demands and the discourse of ecology still place the problems of ecology in such a purely physical sense as if simply we're dealing with kind of quantities of this and that. We can see here, you know, at the level, uh, a form of kind of cultural solicitude which constitutes a kind of ecological intervention within the culture whose aim, in some sense, is to repair. We know, at the end of the 20th century, how limited the work of repair can be. We know that we cannot have everything just as we cannot change everything. But in this function of solicitude for evil sites, however modestly, the architect finds something which was always a secret aspect of their craft. I'd like to stop there. Okay, um, I think we should move straight to the panel. Would you like to come and Matthias come up and maybe answer? I mean, we haven't, I think, enabled the audience to uh, raise issues. I think, for example, if Astrid would also come up, because I think there were probably more questions to be had about the Berlin. two rather long days, I think we shouldn't um, go on more than about half an hour. Uh, I think someone, one of you wanted to ask Astrid. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm yes. Tired, but, uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, would have liked to kind of sort out my uh, comment. I was um, quite um, having some questions to your talk and actually the ultimate proposal um, because I see it much more critical. I think there's uh, uh, some um, important questions which could discuss with this um, monument. The, uh, some topics you um, explained. So the first thing I would argue, I mean, the question, even so, it, uh, partly by the designer, is intended to be abstract. You also mentioned that it kind of reminds of a cemetery. So the question is, um, does not the object gain a certain meaning? Um, and I think it has very strongly this uh, idea of a cemetery, if you um, perceive it. Um, this also, for me, poses a question, what is the rule of this kind of uh, memorial in the context of Germany, meaning if you kind of memorize there the kind of victims of the Holocaust um, in a very artificial manner, meaning this uh, piece of architecture or art kind of almost being an, an alien element which is totally artificially constructed, even so if you go to this historic site, if it's um, 
Sachsenhausen or Dachau or Ravensburg or whatsoever, I mean, where the actual cemeteries are, you kind of can discover a lot of meanings. And in this memorial, it became already almost kind of a clean um, cemetery without saying much about what the whole history was um, kind of involved into society and so on. So it doesn't speak very much. It's kind of a very silent um, um, memorial in the way that it's so artificially produced. This is like for me the one question. The second question is what you also explained, um, that there is already in the idea of Eisenman the intention that the uh, visitor should be lonely and should kind of gain a certain amount of fear being in the monument. And I mean, as we made the point earlier, and also my cousin made now the point, I mean, the question is, what is the idea to put a visitor into the role of the victim? Um, a third question, um, which I want not to kind of too strongly emphasize, but I mean, at least raise a question. There's also a little bit strange thing going on in Berlin in saying that all these places which have to deal with German identity, basically, and designed by non-Germans, which I think it can be possible, but kind of that it's the, the case for all of them. It's a little bit bizarre kind of people, Germans being afraid kind of to, uh, to do it themselves. I mean, if you look, the Reichstag was redesigned by Norman Foster, which is of course an element of German identity. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the memorial for the Holocaust is now kind of commission of Eisenman. The, 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 the topography of terrors is something which is Sumtor is doing as a Swiss person. So I mean, this is uh, the, uh, the Jewish Museum is done by Lieberstein. So it's a little bit bizarre that there is in all these cases not um, was not able a German person kind of to develop a, a, a convincing proposal. And um, yeah, okay, that's so far the, these three questions which I would like to pose. Three questions is quite a lot. Um, I tried to start with the last one. Mm, I think it makes a certain sense that it's for an architect in the context of Berlin because you couldn't take home. Off. I mean, that's the simple. You cannot um, put in the typical Berlin architecture into this site because it would continue a certain sense of forgetting about this period. It would um, suggest a certain sense of continuity from the 19th century on. So it makes certain sense that a kind of minimalist or different way of architecture takes place. And then it might also be to another degree that they simply had the better competition entries of interesting ones. So um, to certain degrees due to that too. Um, I'm not sure why the Germans have to do it on their own. I mean, they reflect the whole process. No, I, I'm not so saying that they have to. It's just kind of astonishing that all these places which deal with German identity, and uh, I mean, that this is kind of almost an escape to try to express yourself. I mean, it looks to me, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not so sure about this point. But well, maybe it's even more banal. I mean, like we have to, we have to face it that for them, I mean, for I mean, a lot of those projects, like the the name of the Jewish architect is some kind of an insurance policy, you know, for local, for local. Uh, Politicians. I mean, we have to. I mean, that's very clear. That doesn't mean that the that the uh, architects are acting like that, but this is how they are used in yeah, a way. Yeah, so, yes, of course. Yes. which which casts, I think, a very uh, uh, good light onto their uh, you know their mental uh, situation they are in. You know, like I mean, they they really need that. I mean, especially like in Sachsenhausen. We I, I mean, we are we are not fooling ourselves. That this is like a big aspect of our work there. But but it's also true for the memorial, as um, there were four entries recommended by the finding commission on the second round. It was the senate who wanted Liebeskind to be in for political reasons, for city political mm. reasons. So they actually really decided like that. Um, question number two. Was regarding the, the body and the experience of being a victim. I think I did not really argue um, but it makes a lot of sense to re-experience the being a victim. I think I went into the direction of the fact of wanting to build this memorial um, shows a certain difference in behavior, um, which in the sense becomes affirmative. 
True, there was a certain confusion in the paper. Um, the vi experience of a victim, I think, mm -hmm. is something Brumlik has argued about, you guys call it as sublime. Um, you're supposed to re-experience the terror of being lonely in there, but it's only the imagination of the terror. In that sense, it becomes kitschig. Use the term mm -hmm. kitschig later in your paper. So in that sense, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. um, but still, the idea of an anamnetic solidarity is something that makes sense to me. Because you need to be able to establish a difference between um, what happened before and what happens now. I mean, you need to be able to draw this difference in order for continuity. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone in the, in the kind of hall have issues that sort of weren't taken up in the discussion of Eisenman's project? He wasn't so happy about the graveyard. He, um, he, can't, can't he wasn't too happy. I mean, no, but he did the analogy thing. I mean, it was his idea with the, um, I think he argues with the void, and he also argues with the experience of the victims. So, but it's more, it's similar to the Jewish Museum in the sense that you have an analogy of experience. It's not so much that it definitely represents something, and he didn't want, for example, the inscriptions on the pillars. He didn't want the names on them, because then it becomes too strong the analogy of a, of a, um, Right, but, but I think what he wants is an under-determination de under of form um, that allows a certain interpretation, but it's never a complete one. So it's always open-ended. It's always a little bit, but not complete. And in that sense, it can continue. But I've never been able to kind of suppress the thought that, um, I mean, if it's right that Chancellor Cole responded very positively actually to the design, uh, you know, there's something to be said. There's also a specific, uh, I'm sorry, a, a specific political deal. And Kanzler Kohl was kind of prom promoting the Neue Wache, and of course, all again in this way, kind of memorizing everybody. I mean, including the soldiers. And he only got agreement by the uh, Jewish community by supporting the idea of the Holocaust memorial. So this was basically a gentleman agreement or something kind of. It was a, a, a deal between the two uh, 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 groups involved. It no. was not that he was just kind of directly launching the Holocaust remark. That, that may be so, but in a sense, um, one can still, I think, intuit that that project, in terms of design, uh, will look entirely different to people in New York, where it constitutes, you know, a not atypical piece of New York minimalism. Mm. And to Chancellor Cole, you know, who brings probably, you know, I mean, he's not exactly a major collector of Carl Andre. <laughs> um, uh, you know, to him, it looks something like the kind of military cemeteries, uh, the orderliness, the, the, the sort of, in a sense, the, the military kind of regularity and decorum. I don't think it's just that it's the grid. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the cemeteries. It's the military cemeteries grid. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how, where, I mean, in a sense, you could ask the question the other way around. You know, how calculating was Peter Eisenman in this matter? Um, two different kinds of monumentality and to try to uh, bear in mind uh, that uh, the, the question about the foreign architects and the, and the new, mo new, new buildings. Because um, you have two, two kinds of monumentality that seem to have come together in the last five or ten years. Uh, one is uh, the commissioning of monumental buildings for the new capital uh, Berlin and the other is monuments of remembrance uh, and uh, to some extent perhaps I could refer them to this distinction Malmal, Denmal although it's not an exact parallel um, and I'd like to refer it again to the problem of the generational moment that was described in the first lecture here today um, 
Um, because one might say, well, it, 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 of course, it's purely contingent that uh, the unification of uh, Germany came uh, just um, what, 45 years after 45 or 35. Uh, there's a certain uh, that, and, and that is also the moment at which the victims of the Holocaust begin to die. Uh, and, and so somehow there's this uh, historical conjunction of two entirely different orders of monuments, um, which seem to be suddenly thematic and centrally thematic in, in German architecture. I'm not, I'm not so sure that they're really that different. I mean, this term has been established in the 60s, do you know? Sorry? Mahnmal? When was it established? I don't know. Yeah, I think, um, but it, it was used for Holocaust memorial. But I think every memor memorial tries to convince, in a sense, or every figurative memorial tries to convince. And once you share the opinion um, figured by the memorial, it's affirmative. Once you don't share that opinion, you're attacked by the memorial. So every memorial takes this role, maybe but the abstract one. Um, so I'm not sure whether this whole distinction really works at all. It, I mean, it's also the, the, I mean, there's a generational shift which is uh, pretty obvious. I mean, until 1990, there was basically no or very, very little Holocaust memorials <coughs> or uh, memorial, uh, yeah, Holocaust memorials. And it started in this time around in, uh, yeah, 85 to 1990 that in Berlin or in Frankfurt Main or in other places, I mean, the work which was done by by our speakers, uh, Hirsch, who couldn't uh, could give a uh, speak to the <coughs> from that time on, all the, the monuments in Berlin regarding the Holocaust are kind of started in the late 80s. And this is, of course, to, uh, in my reading, uh, due to the fact that all the people kind of who have been involved in any way in their life uh, uh, to Nazi time have kind of been out of public positions and so only kind of the generation change having a, a new generation which has no more direct experience at that time enable kind of to to start uh, um, uh, to, to construct these kind of uh, places and the, the other question about the monumentality as for, for buildings I think this is something which is uh, still very um, difficult question in German architecture because I, I think there's still a trend to avoid monumentality on the one hand, I mean in also even in the last 10 years in Berlin discourse, I mean there is, a, a, for political reasons, there is a tendency to, to avoid it and also there is of course as, um, quite some architects who have also um, an interest kind of exper experimenting and working with monumentality but it's still through the kind of shadow of German history, it's still a kind of um, sensitive issue in architectural discourse. Okay. A question for um, <coughs> Philip Oswald and Matthias. You both talk basically about sites um, that are in the process of reappropriation, if you want. Um, maybe to make that connection, um, if I may, yesterday to um, what Neil Leach said a little bit about um, the reappropriation, re even though there it wasn't so much about sites, but rather about monuments. <coughs> um, and obviously in both cases, um, there was a problem in your eyes from your approach um, of suppression that had been there so far, of in the last, like in, in the post-war time of what had happened there during the Third Reich. But you both also presented um, very different solutions to that problem. and. Basically, to Philip, um, I would like to ask, does it really make sense to sort of be opening old wounds again? Um, or what is, what is the meaning of that, of the banality in, in that complete, yeah, in that very banal supermarket that, that was there? I don't want to mm -hmm. go back to that very long discussion, but um, I kind of saw a strange parallel with that banality of the um, kind of, quaint houses that the SS lived in on, on your site. Um, what is the quality that you eventually hope will a, let's say, repaired site, will your repaired site have? Um, and is it maybe possible that eventually that, that banality can, can already be a quality or is, 
or would you say that banality is something that you would definitely dislike? I mean, the one thing I would not say in the in the in the sense that kind of uh, that a meaning has to pressed in the I mean in the in the time of the occupation of the Red Army. It's a very complex story. I mean, the Red Army has liberated the camp, and I think really I mean it's not appreciated normally well enough in Germany. Kind of that the Red Army did kind of the major uh, um, effort to to fight Nazi Germany, and it was basically more or less uh, more their contribution than of the West Allies. I mean, it was really very important why kind of West, West Allies more see, uh, more, uh, sometimes more uh, uh, neglect the, the, the role of the Red Army, which they have had in the Second World War. So I think it was basically, I mean, this is not a point, um, at least for me as a German, to criticize the Red Army using the site later on for their own military use. I mean, this is something, I think th this has happened, and this is, I mean, that was the case. I, I would not uh, discuss it under the, the, the with the word of suppression or so. I mean, now the situation is of course different. I mean, it's of course it was a problem as Stephen pointed out that it was not accessible for for the people, and actually it still is not accessible at the site for the reasons I, I told. And I think I mean maybe along the line what Marx uh, was saying, kind of it belongs to like the public knowledge. And I mean, there's also hundred fifty thousand around 100 or 150,000 people coming a year to the site. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a public spot in the sense that there's a lot of people from very different backgrounds coming to the site. I mean, it's not only the, the kind of the people who have been victims and suffered, there's also even kind of people of the persecutors coming back to the site. Of course, there's a lot of uh, um, people from the, I mean, they come from all over, <coughs> all over uh, Europe. And so there is a big interest in the problem is if you go there, there's little to be understood. So I think there is a need kind of to, uh, to, exp uh, to make things more readable. And this is actually what we try uh, to do. So this, I think, is mm. enough for the moment. Um, just, just uh, sorry, AR was, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, I, throughout the two days of this conference, I had a very strange uh, sense of deja vu. Um, partly because I was in Berlin in the uh, mid 90s. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of that project of Berlin, yeah, which is at, at somehow at the end of its, uh, I think it's the end of its phase. Uh, although, you know, Eisenhower's project specifically has not been has not been built, but the discussion has been going on for since since uh, let's say early nineties already, both about uh, yesterday's discussion regarding the kind of the urbanism of, of New Berlin and the, the stitching together of the city. I don't know. I, I think I read I read uh, Mark's contribution a bit differently. I think I think it is it, it's you know you can't really terminate this 
these these questions by just saying, okay, now we have to move over to another to another stage because it is. I mean, all these, you know, what 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 was described is, you know, the, the what what Freud described so well. I think it's still underway, and it will be underway for another maybe like fifty years or sixty years, maybe even longer. I think that's not the point. I mean, the point is not okay. Uh, you know, why are we still talking about the same issues? Because the same issues are. I would say they are just unearthed, you know, like uh, yesterday, especially after the, I mean, this is why the conference is really talking, maybe like yeah. happening now, because the, re the German reunification brought it all up again in a very dramatic way. And I think it's, you know, from like, and there are a lot of different aspects to this. And, you know, like Philip pointed out that, you know, before German reunification, there were hardly any traces of what happened before because, you know, and there are reasons maybe for it. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go on. Just like uh, to to refer back to the one point there about the banality of the things. I mean, we have to we have to face it that what what all these things that happened they were very banal. You know, people lived their uh, their day to day life. All these. This is not the question. The question is, and that is what I liked in your in your point is this. I think the key word today for me in the lecture was this question of ecology of mind. You know, it's it's really about. I mean, not like you, you cannot like finalize this discussion. You cannot, um, uh, you cannot even think that you come to a to a <coughs> to a like termination of the question. How are, how are we showing those things? You know, like it's of course there are aspects that you would support, others you not. But it's not. It's it's really impossible to say. Okay, now we find the form. You know, now we find the right way to talk about it. I think that's that that will never happen. And I'm really happy that we have this discussion. After I don't know. After I think we had like. 40, 40 years we had we, we didn't have this discussion in Germany. I think there is one point in, in what Riyadh says. I mean, um, I think it's interesting that everyone kind of took the term reunification uh, to kind of refer solely mm. uh, to East and West. And I think one of the issues is there's not a reunification, um, which is that between Jews and Germans. Uh, now, in a sense, the story, as it were, has yet, in a sense, to be told of the kind of peculiar intimacy uh, between Jews and kind of Germans dating from whatever you want mm. to date it from, late 18th century or something. <coughs> so much so that there's, a, there's one thing which I think I've always noticed, actually, no one could ever quite bear to talk about. Um, when they're talking about the Holocaust, which really is, is this. That we say six million Jews were murdered by the Nazis. Now, I'm going to ask a question which in a sense kind of sounds kind of mad, but I don't think it is. I mean, were they Jews? Now, when you consider, as it were, that in orthodox terms, you know, a Jew will be defined matrilineally, right? On the other hand, you have a Nazi definition of a Jew, which will be something like a quarter Jewish or something. I mean, wh whatever it kind of cashes out in the calculus of racial identity in Nuremberg laws. So while people were being sent as Jews to the camps um, through the Nuremberg racial laws, they were entering the camps as Germans. Now that's even before, as it were, you take up the question of the fact that obviously what characterized German Jewish kind of community was precisely its extreme assimilation, I mean, compared uh, with other Western European cultures, and certainly, obviously, with kind of for uh, Ostjuden. Um, so, this kind of category, six million Jews, which everyone obviously, it, it's interesting, they not only assume it does have a stable referent, but that it has to have a stable referent. And what is the reference? Mm. I mean, uh, I, I, this is not sort of like this is not some specialized kind of Holocaust denial argument. <laughs> uh, I'm making the point that people went there, in a sense, under different descriptions. Now, actually, 
the six million Jews, paradoxically, is a Nazi description. They may not have wanted it to be known, but it's on the basis of a Nazi classification that is six million Jews. Mm. I hesitate to calculate kind of how many matrilineal kind of Jews did or did not kind of perish. But what you find here is, what is, is almost a universal repression. Mm. It's a repression in an odd way kind of shared between Jews and Nazis. That, that in a sense if you open that question you open a question about the intrication of persons um, in which you would really need to sort of reformulate the term significantly. It's a jump from that, but in a, in a paradoxical sense, when Eyal says perhaps uh, there's a new period, perhaps one of the contributions that a renewed Jewish life in Germany can provide is paradoxically to assist Germans to free themselves from the Holocaust. I mean, Sorry, I didn't mean to. We've sort of reached. Sorry. 